Hi. Okay. <laughs> so my name is Vanessa Sauter. I'm super excited to be here today. I come from Cobalt.io. We are a pen testing as a service startup based a few blocks away. Today, we are going to build the VoIP comp test for web application vulnerabilities. Does anyone know what that is? Or am I just like super nerdy? Do we know? Okay. Okay, cool. It's Blade Runner theme, so I apologies. This, my apologies. This is a very nerdy uh, talk, and I'm a very nerdy person. Um, all right, so a little bit about me to get us started. Let's see if this is going to work. Uh, one sec. Uh, yeah, sorry, guys. There we go. Yep. All right, cool. So, as I said, my name is Vanessa. Uh, I don't actually know if I'm replicant or organic. The Tyrell Corporation has not tested me yet, uh, but I'm going to take a safe bet that I'm probably organic. Uh, I used to work at Brookings and the Aspen Institute. My focus was cybersecurity policy within the parameters of national security. A lot of the work that I did was focused on the threat motivations behind APTs, and from that I, I, um, I looked at the value of vulnerabilities and thinking about how vulnerabilities intersect uh, with the way that APTs operate. And now I'm at Cobalt. I moved to San Francisco about six months ago, and I am super excited about the work I'm doing right now. My co-researcher on this talk, he's not here today, he's based in Virginia, is Travis McCormick. He is a technical program manager at Cobalt, uh, what I would call a shepherd of our pen tests and our pen testers. He's a badass data wrangler and a former lead specialist of security testing at Walmart and uh, helped me a lot, mostly with the data for this talk. All right, let's kick it off. Why does method matter? In other words, who the hell cares if a machine or human finds the vulnerabilities? A vuln is a vuln, right? Does it really matter in the end the method through which a vulnerability is reported? So I think what we actually need to ask is a two-part question. The question of human or machine goes further than this. I recently finished the book, Cult of the Dead Cow, and what author Joe Munn encapsulates so well is the curiosity and joy of breaking things. It is part of the human condition. Some of you in this room may viscerally understand the high from finding an exploit and find delight in the unexpected path it takes you. Others, like myself, may aspire to one day achieve that kind of rush. This talk, in part, is a recognition of that joy. It is a celebration of human curiosity and perseverance. OK, but on a much more pragmatic level, there is also a very legitimate business case for discerning between human and machine. Analysts predict the global application security market will reach up to $9.64 billion by the end of 2023. That's a compound annual growth rate of 25.95%, an industry that's nearly $10 billion. That's fucking huge. And the market is rising to the demand. Today, there are hundreds of companies geared toward application security. Scanners that cost tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars are competing against open source tools. The efficacy of some of these tools, it remains a little bit unclear. We'll get a little bit more into that later. Freelancers are looking for the same bugs that a specialized pen tester working for a consultancy is searching for. Results-oriented work is now pitted against time-boxed work. The question of human and machine is now a question of ascertaining value in a results-driven market. It's now part of the strategy for choosing vendors, allocating resources, and determining the best use for InfoSec's greatest scarcity, which is time. So let's dive in. I chose web application vulnerabilities for a reason. From the data I can find, web apps continue to be the most tested across the board. As you can see here, for Cobalt, more than 65% of our pen tests conducted last year were web apps or web apps and APIs. OK, so that's Cobalt, but what about bug bounty? It's the same. Hacker One says bug bounty hunters predominantly hack web apps. For bug crowd, 90% of the targets were also web apps. I would love to see some research on other targets, like internal or external networks or cloud. But for the purpose of this talk, we're sticking to web apps. I think it could be a great uh, potential future research project for me or anyone else to think about 
uh, other types of applications, cloud or external internal networks, but for right now it's just web apps. Okay, a little bit about this research. The scope of this research is dynamic scanning and black box testing. This includes, and this is really important, this includes out of band scanning, which finds vulns like second order or blind, second order SQL or blind cross site scripting. I'm gonna get into that a little bit more later. So we wanted to answer three questions for this research. One, what, vulnerab what vulnerabilities can dynamic scanners find? Two, what are the vulnerabilities that only humans can find, meaning dynamic scanners cannot reliably find them? Three, what are the vulnerabilities for which scanners will not automatically populate results, but where automated tools can enhance efficiency to conduct further exploitations? So we generated input from Cobalt's core, which is our pool of roughly 300 freelance vetted pen testers. Uh, full caveat, they had a lot of opinions about this and there was a ton of disagreement, which is great. Uh, it definitely generated some conversation. And then the examples I pulled, uh, I relied on public bug bounty reports, OWASP and Port Swigger. The researcher in me would have loved to pull from Cobalt's results, but we actually don't disclose customer vulnerabilities, even if they're anonymized. So we relied on public reports, which are actually really great for this purpose. Um, and of course, humans can have a little proxy as a treat. Okay, so what kind of web app vulnerabilities is Cobalt finding? First off, we're finding a lot. Misconfig continues to dominate. It's a pretty broad category that ranges from cookie attributes to business logic bypass. OWASP list, lists misconfig as number six in its top 10 web app security risks. But for the second year in a row, misconfiguration leads in our findings, followed by cross-site scripting attacks. Uh, so my apologies for the labeling, it's a little bit hard to see, so I'm just gonna clarify for all of you. Uh, top is misconfiguration, followed by cross-site scripting, authentication in sessions, other, sensitive data exposure, missing access controls, insecure object reference, components with known vulnerabilities, redirects and forwards, server-side request forgery, and finally our favorite RCE. Okay, let's, let's uh, dive in. So here's where the machine wins. You can take a look at this list, I'm not gonna read it out for you. I'm gonna dive a little bit into why the machine wins here. Dynamic scanners work by injecting malicious payloads. They test access points when they are communicating with the front end. Scanners are programmed to understand arguments and function calls, so they can detect vulns in headers, verbs, and fragments. They can also identify some misconfigurations, and they can find components with known vulnerabilities. One of the disagreements that we've had with our pen testers and with people I've talked to as a whole is whether scanners could reliably find trickier vulnerabilities like second order SQL or blind cross-site scripting. A standard cross-site scripting or SQL attack, for instance, produces an immediate result, like an alert prompt that says, hello world, or data spilled into an input field. When you see that, you can immediately recognize the success of a payload. But what happens when a payload is successfully injected, but the vulnerability's output isn't produced immediately? Blind vulnerabilities mean the request response is obfuscated in some way, making it difficult or impossible to interpret. Out-of-band vulnerabilities means the response does not return within the same interface through which the attack was sent. With blind or out vulnerabilities, you won't see the vulnerabilities output immediately. I think many people here assume at that point that the machine would not win. But this is often because the application activates the payload at a later point, thus requiring the pen tester to have back-end knowledge of the system to know if the payload was successful. If there's no echo in the cave, are you yelling loud enough or is it actually a tunnel? I've concluded that for the purpose of this research, the answer is yes. Machines are awarded blind, second order, or otherwise out of band vulnerabilities that can be used with a certain type of dynamic scanner or out of band scanner. Okay, so I'm sure you're wondering why the asterisks. Scanners still require manual setup and they produce a significant number of vulnerabilities. So a human will still have to configure any scanner and sift the results. But for the purpose of finding vulnerabilities, 
the list that I provided is an exhaustive display of what scanners can find relatively easily. But of course, don't be fooled. We all know who's pulling the strings. I really hope it's not the Tyrell Corporation. Okay, there can be an entire talk on the efficacy of certain scanners over others, and there's actually a lot of great research out there. Um, I just included a couple lists of just like open source scanners that you can use that are actually really reliable. Um, some companies claim their tools can find certain vulnerabilities, and then others might dispute those claims. I'm not saying some of these companies are lying, but I will say that the results can prove inconsistent. Yes, maybe a scanner could find a certain type of vulnerability, but with a high false positive rate or a slim success rate, or with a ton of configuration, like hours upon hours of configuration, maybe a scanner could find a certain type of vuln. Um, this is where it gets a little bit tricky here, and I'm gonna get into a little bit more detail why later um, in another slide. I highly, re I highly recommend checking out Shay Chan's research, comparing the price and features of web app scanners on the market, both commercial and open source. There's actually some really great research being done on this. Um, I wanna pause right now and ask, what vulnerabilities do you think humans win at? You can shout it out. Business logic, Business logic. okay. Any other vulns? In the back. What was it? Access control, okay. Anyone else? What? SQL injection, okay. One more? Social engineering doesn't count because it's web apps, but I like that thought. Yes? A uh, complex flow where you need to use the output of one step into another and... So chained exploits, basically. Yeah. Complex flow. Okay, anyone else? IDOR? All right, okay, we've got, we've got a pretty, uh, we've got a quorum of ideas here. Okay, here's the list of vulnerabilities among our pen testers that we could agree only humans can find. Business logic bypass, race conditions, and chained exploits. Uh, like I said, there was not consensus, so we, what we had to do was boil it down to basically the three that everyone could agree on. That was this list. So now I'm gonna pull some cool examples just to show how these exploits work. So a, hand, a couple, excuse me, a few years ago, a handful of core pen testers worked on a bug bounty for Uber. What they found was a pretty interesting business logic bypass that then, someone mentioned IDOR, that then led to an IDOR. Okay, so how did they do it? First, they figured out that any user could create a driver account but that account couldn't be activated until Uber verified their driver documents. That seems reasonable, right? Like you want your Uber driver to actually have a driver's license. You couldn't access the Uber driver app until you were verified, or at least that's what Uber intended. When looking at the request screenshot on the left, there was a parameter called allow not activated that was set to false. So what happens if you set it to true? They obtained a valid session token, no bueno. In the response, there was a field called is activated and it was set to false. But when they changed it to true, they were able to access the driver app. This later allowed them to access another driver's name, license plate, last trip UUID, last passenger name, number of passengers, origins, and trip destination through an IDOR. Okay, as my colleague Travis likes to say, Building stuff is hard. It's really freaking hard. It's way easier to break things than to build things. So business logic attacks exploit design flaws or unintended abuse of business logic, like having a user controllable parameter that is trusted. I pulled this research here from Marco Morana, how to prevent business uh, flaws, vulnerabilities, in web applications, and it gives you a list of why, right? Weak enforcement of workflows, poor parameter validation like we saw, misconfig of access control, some of you mentioned that as well, authentication flaws, so really you have to have a very strong understanding of the systems and how they operate to be able to exploit this. A machine does not have the context that's required to be able to identify these kinds of vulnerabilities. Okay, what's up next? First of all, 
I love the handle cash money. That's like brilliant in my mind. Second of all, I could paraphrase this phone for you, but Shopify explained it really well, so I'm just gonna pull straight from the bug bounty report. Cash Money reported it was possible to bypass the email verification process in our partner's dashboard. Doing so would have allowed a partner to request access to a store under an email address the partner did not own. If the store had a staff account associated with that email address, the staff account would have been automatically converted to a collaborator account and added to the partner's dashboard without any merchant interaction. We tracked down the bug to a race condition and the logic for changing and verifying email addresses. We fixed it by locking the database record during those actions and requiring store administrators to approve all collaborator requests. In my opinion, this is actually another clear example of understanding business logic as well. To really excel at finding bones like this, you have to understand the intended processes driving the business and ask yourself, but what if I tried this instead? For cash money, the answer to this question was $15,250 for a time of check, time of use race condition. Honestly, in my opinion, that was pretty well deserved. Okay, so what's up with race conditions? The Shopify bug was exploited through a time of check, time of use race condition. As you see here, there's a multi-step process to successfully exploit this kind of vulnerability. Race conditions are caused by not locking a file, meaning there's a race between when a file is open and not locked by the process. It was bad with Shopify, but you can probably imagine how even more serious a race condition would be for a bank, like when approving a bank transfer. I am sure that some of you in this room right now are sitting on your hands, believing that scanners can find race conditions, and that's because I've tricked you. Can a scanner find this? Maybe. But if it's a source code review, static analysis could probably ensure that you are locking your files. But a dynamic scanner is not gonna find this. And remember, as I said, it's dynamic scanning versus, uh, versus black box testing. Yes, race conditions are probably found through fuzzing tools, but that's not the same thing as a scanner. Fuzzing isn't necessarily a function of a vulnerability scanner, and it does not tell you what the vulnerability is. You have to find what breaks first through fuzzing. Another classic example of this is buffer overflows. You can set up fuzzers to run all night to cause crashes, but you're still gonna have to figure out what caused the crash. You need to know what to look for. You have to triage, identify the vulnerability, and the same thing goes for race conditions. Okay, last up, as you mentioned, chain exploits. I think this is pretty self-explanatory, so I'm not gonna get too in-depth here. The example I included is actually from one of our core pen testers, and I'm just gonna read off the hacker one summary. Shopify infrastructure is isolated into subsets of infrastructure. Zero uh, X ACB, I have no idea how he actually wants to pronounce that, reported it was possible to gain root access to any container in one particular subset by exploiting a server-side request forgery bug in the screenshotting function of a Shopify exchange. Within an hour of receiving the report, we disabled the vulnerable service, began auditing applications in all subsets, and remediating across all our infrastructure. The vulnerable subset did not include Shopify core. After auditing all services, we fixed the bug by deploying a metadata concealment proxy to disable access to metadata information. We also disabled access to internal IPs on all infrastructure subsets. We awarded this $25,000 as a Shopify core RCE since some applications in this subset do have access to some Shopify core data and systems. If you can find a scanner that can successfully find an RCE through a server-side request forgery, I'm all ears, like I want to invest money in that. But in the meantime, I think we can safely say only a human can find this. Um, okay, how many of you actually disagree with this? I'm very curious, or have opinions. I see a hand in the back, that's good, I like that. Okay, uh, the truth is if you, do, if you disagree with these results, I really don't blame you. Uh, it's not actually black or white. It's not actually a void comp test. You can't actually pit machines against humans. As we discussed with race conditions, tools are instrumental now in finding vulnerabilities. Just as scanners rely on humans for configuration and sifting through false positives, humans rely on machines to automate more menial tasks. No one, well, 
I think most people, do not want to type out every variation of a JavaScript payload known to man to prompt a little one in an alert box. That just sounds absolutely awful. I'm very glad that scanners can help us with that. So here's a new section. Humans and machine, a new frontier. A list of vulnerabilities that scanners cannot reliably find, but humans can't really find without some sort of tool that they use. Authorization flaws, XXE, SAML, uh, certain types of cross-site scripting, insecure deserialization, RCE, session management, and file upload bugs. That was actually one that a lot of our pen testers thought uh, humans should be awarded, but I still think the machines kind of get that one as well, so we place it in the middle. Um, so I'm just going to give you a case study on why it is that some of these rely on both humans and machines, and that is IDOR. Uh, I just pulled this straight from Portswigger. So Portswigger's instructions for fighting an IDOR clearly demonstrate uh, exactly how humans rely on tools to be able to find certain types of vulnerabilities. First, you have to set up burp proxy. Then you have to send a request to intruder, find the section of the URL that refers to an object, head over to the payload, tailor the number, and then start the attack. From there, you can take other actions like enumerating accounts. The machine does most of the work. But the human must first identify input that's a direct object reference and then send a thousand iterations. Boom, proxy does the rest of the work. One of the things I realized in conducting this research is how valuable it is to know the fundamentals. And when I say fundamentals, I truly mean it. I'm talking about simple networking protocols and web development, understanding TCP IP, understanding HTTPS, knowing the basics of web development, you know who I think would excel at finding a business logic bypass or a race condition? Someone who has like multiple years as, as a sysadmin. From my own perspective, as a pen testing white belt, um, it's helped me re reprioritize how I approach application security and even how I study and test on my own time. So enough of me talking. I don't want to do questions. I want to open, open it up for debate. We have a microphone here. Uh, basically, tell me what you're thinking. Tell me what you disagree with. Tell me what you agree with. This is not intended to be an authoritative list. I want this to generate conversation. It's an iterative process. Um, so with that, let's open it up. Yes. So it's only dynamic scanning. It does not look at source code. Yeah. And that's specifically for web apps and web apps and APIs. Huh? Um, it was a question of, about the type of scanner that's being used and whether, source, and whether it was evaluating source code. Yeah. Does anyone think the machine does not win in this case, in any of these cases? Or does anyone have like a Python script that they wrote that's on GitHub where they like feel pretty confident that they can find a race condition? Because some people have said that. Yes? It's using a lot of bug bounties. Okay, so Tanya said that uh, her old partner built a tool, a race condition tool that's actually used for bug bounty programs. Cool. Anyone else have disagreements or ideas or agreements? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. Um, my question for you though is it is it looking at is it looking at the source code or is it doing dynamic and black box? Okay. 
Okay, I would love to take a look at that, so um, I will definitely check it out and see. Thank you for flying. Um, okay, and I think that's it, we're done. So thank you so much everyone for coming. <laughs>